Good evening, everyone. And so begins the great three days of Easter. Imagine all around the world right now, Christians are gathering to remember the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope, as I will say in my sermon tonight, that you will be able to stay for the full three days through the peaks and valleys of all this time has to offer. Welcome. This evening is a most poignant and beautiful service. And after the homily, people will be invited to come forward and to have their feet washed. Four people I know for sure will be coming forward, but if there are others of you who would like to come and to have your feet washed, once the first four have left their seats, I invite others of you to do the same. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls to worship Almighty God.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. On this sacred night, we enter the three days of the Lord's Passover, the sacred triduum, the paschal mystery of our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection, into which the elect of the church will be initiated. We pray that our own return to the baptismal waters by way of basin and pitcher and by the way of cross will renew us in the risen life of Christ Jesus, who reigns above all forever and ever. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were with him in this world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. During supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come, the time, had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, One who has bathed need not wash, except the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, although not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, 
Servants are not greater than the master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God also will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. During these three days, we who tend time, who are timekeepers to so many things, now enter a very different rhythm of time. It's time in these three days to set aside our clocks and calendars, our to-do lists and our watches, and to enter fully into these three sacred days. We move from clock-ticking Kronos time to God's Kairos time. Kairos means the right time. As we move from here this evening, tomorrow we will find ourselves in the courtyard, on the road to Golgotha, on the hill, and back down to the garden where our Lord Jesus Christ will be buried. And as we move all of time will fall away because now we are entering an extended gospel of these days. In some parts of rural South Africa, whole communities spend these three days together. They pack up children and animals and enough food to sustain them for what will be required for these three days. And they take over the whole school to reenact the drama of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. In one community, they call it the weekend of E Good, because it is this time that good overcomes darkness. And although we will not be together for the whole time, we will be doing the same thing, you and me, over the next three days. And we will put the same energy and the same prayer into the Kairos time we will spend together here. Theologian James Lamkin writes about these three days. And this is what he says. These three days comes with a rigorous theological topography. It's theological and emotional peaks and valleys and plateaus offer an exercise in intimacy and distance, along with hope and despair. In fact, the extreme journey of these three days may leave one broken, broken open and vacant 
to receive Easter's gift. There is a beautiful chant, a Teze chant that I love, which is often sung in these three days. It is Jesus' plea in the garden to his disciples to tarry with him for one hour. And the chant is just a repetition of these words. Stay with me. Remain here with me. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Stay with me. Remain here with me. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. These days are truly liminal time. That in-between time of what is and what we hope for. It is the time for us to sit in the darkness and be with Jesus, even as he invites us to stay with him. Remember this, though. We sit with him these three days at table this night with the beloved disciple John, who wrote the gospel we heard this evening. Remembering that the identity that marks us most is not the noun, disciple, but rather the adjective, beloved. Never forget that. You are beloved of God. And so we come to this night, this night of shadows and hushed voices and whispers. If you have ever witnessed a dying person say goodbye to loved ones, you will know that it is a powerful and a poignant thing to see. They labor to find the right words they want to share with their loved ones. And every word is pregnant with meaning and significance, with love and consolation, and even with hope and expectation. I remember this well with my dying mother. How much love was in her last words to me. But in my typical motherly fashion, she could not resist a few final lessons. Remember to say please, Anne. Never forget to say thank you. Well, today's gospel from John presents the beginning of Jesus' farewell to his disciples. He has been aware that his hour would come. In fact, he's been preparing for that hour his entire life. And if you look at the whole of Jesus' farewell discourse in John's gospel, you will see that it begins and it ends by referring to love. Maundy Thursday, this night, comes from the Latin word mandatum, or command. It is the day of Jesus' greatest teaching about love. I give you a new commandment, he says, that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Love lies at the heart of all Jesus' teachings and ultimately is at the heart of everything that these three days will be about. As John sets the scene for us, the Passover feast is approaching. This meal in John's Gospel is different from the Synoptics because their Passover happens the evening before different from the synoptics as it occurs the evening before Passover. And Jesus wants to leave his disciples with something to show the full extent of his love. Now we already know the rest of the story, don't we? 
But if we didn't, we might expect a climactic ending more like the one found in the Old Testament when the prophet Elijah was about to depart the world in a brilliant blaze of glory. Elijah asks Elisha, the one to follow in his footsteps, what gift Elisha would like to receive before Elijah is taken from him. Let me inherit a double share of your spirit, Elisha calls, and Elijah obliges. Right before he leaves for heaven in a chariot of fire, he leaves behind the mantle he has just used to part the waters of the Jordan River. Elisha picks up the mantle and holding it over the river, calling on Elijah's God, he discovers that he too can part the mighty river at his command. Can we not imagine a similar hope from Jesus' followers? If you are leaving Jesus, and if you truly want to show us how much you love us, then infuse us with a double portion of your power. Give us some memento of yourself infused with magical properties, some token that we can use for our future greatness in the world. What a shock for the disciples. What a shock for us if we listen to the story with fresh ears that Jesus demonstrates his love, not by passing on a mantle of authority and power, but in an act of servanthood, by using a towel and a basin of water. The mantle of Jesus' authority is a tool of practical, daily, unglamorous service. A towel. Jesus rises from the table and lifting off his outer garments, he wraps a towel around his waist. And then he proceeds on all fours to wash his disciples' dirt encrusted feet. Now, according to the MacTilda, which is a commentary, a Jewish commentary, not even a Hebrew slave was expected to perform such a menial task. Foot washing was a sign of hospitality in Jesus' day, but a slave would bring a bowl of water to a guest and invite him or her to wash their own feet. A towel. Jesus uses that object that is used to wash dishes, wipe tables, clean floors, cool fevers, dry tears, mop up sweat, blot away stains. An object so common, no one thought about them, and every household had them. After the foot washing in John's Gospel, Jesus will have more to say to his followers about returning to his Father, about the promise and work of the Holy Spirit, about remaining in and with the true vine. He will speak about the world's hate and give them and us an antidote to that hate, which is love. He will give them and us a new commandment to love one another as they have been loved. And in closing his farewell words, he will pray for his disciples that they will be one as he and the Father are one. But this night, in this act of foot washing, without any words, Jesus is passing on three important lessons in humility, in hospitality, 
and in reconciliation. Initially, Peter, we know, doesn't want to accept the gift of foot washing. You will never wash my feet, the reluctant, embarrassed Peter exclaims. His resistance sounds like modesty, but it is in fact a form of pride. Sometimes, like Peter, we also resist becoming vulnerable, preferring to remain in control, to choose what gifts we will gratefully receive. Yet a fundamental fact of our humanness is our dependency on others. From the cradle to the grave, we need one another. This is the African concept of Ubuntu, a concept that came into being through Desmond Tutu's teaching. And what Ubuntu is very simply is this, a person is a person through other people. I need you and you need me. With one another, we are complete. Jesus points out to Peter that if he is unable to receive the gift of physical cleansing, he will not be in a position to accept the even more humbling cleansing of sin, which will happen when Jesus dies on that horrendous cross. And the second lesson is the lesson of hospitality. Jesus insists that before the disciples go and wash one another's feet, that they first experience what it is like to receive that gift. But then he teaches, as I have done to you, so are you to go and offer the same gift to others. And finally, this is a lesson in hope and reconciliation in full knowledge that his betrayer was right at the table with him, Jesus washed Judas's feet as an agent of reconciliation even before the betrayal happened. It can still happen today, that gift of reconciliation. In 2006, at an evening service in South Africa, a former official of the government washed the feet of a black activist as an act of apology. In the church in Zion City tonight, the pastor of that church is going to call out the name of someone to come forward and then the person who hurt that individual will be invited to come forward and to wash their feet as a sign and a symbol of reconciliation. Tonight, as we celebrate this communion, this great thanksgiving, as a foretaste of the heavenly banquet, let us give careful thought in our own lives to those we need to be reconciled with. I give you a new commandment, says Jesus, that you love one another. In John's gospel, love is not a vague or sentimental term, but a fully involved, other-oriented and often costly commitment to another person's flourishing. Foot washing is an act of humble service which looks forward to tomorrow when Jesus will humble himself further and in another act of love die alone without his friends on a cross. The invitation for us tonight is to give glory to God in our own lives. And when we leave, to live lives 
in acts of humble, self-giving love. Amen. And when Martin and Cheryl have put the chairs in place, I invite those of you who are going to come and have your feet washed to come forward when you are ready.
offertory hymn is number 57. Father, we spread this table to remember the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your Son. Accept all we offer you this day. Bind us together in his love, and in the love he has commanded us to bring one another, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right we give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name.
Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. If we have died with him, we shall live with him if we hold firm we shall reign with him. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment to love one another as he loved them. Write this commandment on our hearts. Give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all who gave his life and died for us, yet is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation, please be seated as the altar is stripped.